Bienvenue de retour à l'Alliance Française. Uh, my name is Amy Laberge, I'm the director of the program. We're so happy to see you so numerous. Merci pour la porte. Um, so, uh, we keep on exploring the legacy of Hector Guimard this afternoon with three more speakers. Uh, just to let you know how this is going to go, um, we will have a 15 minute break after our first speaker at 2.30 for 15 minutes. Uh, so at uh, 2.45 we will come back until 4 o'clock and at 4 o'clock we will keep the conversation going over a glass of wine in our salon. How about that? Well, I hope you had a good lunch. If you're ready to go, I will welcome back. Elizabeth Cummings uh, to uh, introduce our afternoon speakers. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Amy. Uh, hello again. Uh, is anyone new for the afternoon? Okay, welcome to the <coughs> person. <laughs> um, so thank you all for rejoining us. Um, I'm Elizabeth Cummings, Director of Public Engagement at the Blue House Museum. Um, I am going to introduce our speakers in reverse order so I can end on the uh, next presentation. So, um, at the tail end of the day, we will have Barry Bergdahl, who is the Meyer Shapiro, Shapiro Professor of Art History at Columbia University. Um, his broad interests center on modern architectural history with a particular emphasis on France and Germany since 1750 in exhibitions at the Canadian Centre for Architecture and at the Museum of Modern Art, where he served as Philip Johnson Chief Curator from 2007 to 2013, uh, Barry offered a series of exhibitions intended to offer a more inclusive vision um, of subjects from Mies van der Rohe, uh, the Bauhaus, Henri Le Brust, Le Corbusier, Latin American post-war architecture, and most recently, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, Thank you very much for joining us from New York for this. Um, so just before Barry, we will have Isabel Gournay, uh, who is a professor emerita at the University of Maryland. She received a professional degree in architecture <coughs> from the École Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts. Um, so I guess in addition to being an academic, she also is an architect, which gives us her two sort of lenses into her work. Um, her, uh, her doctorate was from Yale University, and so her major areas of research and publications, um, it's very interestingly, she straddles America and France once again. Um, her publications have included Paris on the Potomac, the French influence on the architecture and art of Washington, D.C., um, and right now she's working on a project on the uh, Americans who studied the, the Beaux-Arts uh, in Paris. Um, and then finally, for our next speaker, we have Leora Auslander, who's the Arthur and Joan, Joanne Rasmussen Professor in Western Civilization in the college, in the college, and professor in the departments of race, diaspora, and indigeneity and history at the University of Chicago. The primary national focus of her research is modern France, but she investigates research problems best treated transnationally. She teaches 19th century and 20th century European social and cultural history with a focus on France and Germany. Uh, material culture, everyday life, uh, material culture of everyday life, um, and the built environment. Jewish history, gender history, theory, race in the Atlantic world, colonial and post-colonial Europe. I don't know anything this woman can't do. <laughs> but very interestingly, um, we were together this summer for a program at the Driehaus Museum in which um, Leora gave a wonderful introduction to the movie Cherie, which was filmed in the Hotel Mazura. So um, it's nice to have her back here. Museum, uh, particularly Elizabeth Cummings, uh, for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to speak here today. The Alliance Française for hosting the event, my fellow speakers for their terrific talks that have been and will be, and the audience for their participation. Uh, I also want to let you know up front, uh, as Elizabeth's introduction suggests, I'm a historian, not an art historian or a curator. 
And so my talk today has a somewhat different orientation uh, and explanatory logic than comes from other disciplines. And so I'll ask your patience as I provide uh, some context concerning both French history and Jewish religious practice, whose relevance may not be immediately apparent to you uh, for concerning the topic of the day, but I promise it will be very soon. So uh, the, this is our object uh, for, this, for this moment. So one of Victor Guimard's more surprising contributions to the built environment is the synagogue that he designed in 1912. The first services were held in 1914 for the association of nine, nine Orthodox congregations in Paris called Agudas Hakidus, which mean, just means the union of communities. The association brought together some of the 35,000 Eastern European Jewish immigrants who in the late 19th century, after having fled the Russian Empire's Pale of Settlement, resided in Paris. Uh, their lives in the Pale had been hard. Most were very poor. Opportunities there were scarce for them. Political rights very limited. And they were vulnerable to intermittent extreme bouts of anti-Semitic violence. The majority settled in Paris's poorest neighborhoods, notably the Plateau of Paris, the area of the Rhine Fourth and the Marais, where we'll be dwelling mostly today, others in Belleville in the north. Uh, and, uh, it is, and it's in this, the, the synagogue that we'll be talking about is uh, in the middle of the plaza. So let me give you a bit of a map of my talk. Um, so I'll start by situating the synagogue in the neighborhood, and then I'll give you a quick sense of Jewish life in Paris, including the other synagogues uh, with which the Guimard synagogue was and is in dialogue. And then I'll use most of my time to talk about the constraints under which Guimard was operating when he designed the synagogue take you through the building itself, and explain why Yima, who on the face of it was a really, really odd choice of, of architect for this building, uh, and offer an explanation for why the Agudas HaKedido was chosen, rather than one of the many op other options. And I'll conclude with a very quick comparison to an equally distinctive but very different synagogue built by Frank Lloyd Wright uh, outside of Philadelphia. So, here's a tourist map put out by the Metro in 1900, just to get you oriented. Um, the Marais, is the, area, the area we're talking about is right in here. It's not, it's not far away, right in that corner. And um, this much less beautiful map, with my even less beautiful scribble on it, um, gives you, will locate you more exactly. So saint Paul is, this is the, the Pletzel of Paris. Pletzel just means little square, little place in Yiddish. Uh, was, was located right here. The, the synagogue de la Rue Pavé is there, around that circle. Uh, the uh, synagogue de la Rue des Tournelles, which I'll be talking about in a minute, is right over here, next to the Place des Vosges. And this is the Rue Pavé, which leads from here across the um, uh, Rue des Rosiers uh, and um, uh, Notre Dame is down there. So just to get you, just to get you located. Um, so the Place was on, um, a stone's throw from the river, and uh, the na this neighborhood was the center of Jewish life in the Middle Ages, but in the 17th century, the swamp was drained and it changed radically in character, becoming an elegant neighborhood, one of the site of fashionable noble society. So this is the Place du Vosges, in uh, an engraving from the next, from the 18th century, and here are just a few examples of some of the very elegant hôtel particulier of the French nobility, uh, was created in part as a rival uh, political district to um, Versailles, located outside of the city. Um, already out of fashion before the revolution, the neighborhood declined radically and in the 19th century and at this end of the century had become seriously dilapidated and the noble dwellings transformed into uh, sweatshops and slums. It was in this period that it reclaimed its earlier identity as one of the city's Jewish neighborhoods. Uh, but its location was further complicated this, uh, um, by its location in the city. Again, the, the, the fourth is area in orange on the map, and this trace is uh, right here. So Louis Saint-Antoine, there it's over the Rivoli, the Champs-Élysées, and it it, so it starts out here in the Bois de Boulogne, ends in the Bois de Vincennes, and it, that's also the, the trace, that's the main boulevard crossing the city, one of the main boulevards crossing the city from east to west, it was also the, tr the line of the first line of the metal uh, built for the Exposition Universelle. 
Um, and um, so that the, the, the scene that I just so showed you is bordering what was also a major commercial street. And so there you see, uh, this is the Metro Stop Sample. Um, with a, a Guimard uh, entryway, um, clearly here, and you see that this is, um, you know, it's a prosperous kind of commercial commercial street at this juncture, and marked marking the center of this neighborhood. As you look at the postcard, you're facing east, uh, and the synagogue is a five-minute walk to the to your left of the Rue Paris, so going up that way. You're looking towards the Bastille and towards the Poitevin's. Uh, and it, um, as I mentioned before, the uh, Rue Pavé uh, intersects with the Rue du Rosier, which was the commercial center of the Jewish uh, neighborhood, and where one saw you could buy your kosher meat there, you could buy your bread, uh, and there was as much uh, the Hebrew characters of Yiddish as uh, the Roman characters of French to be seen on the storefronts uh, of, the, of the neighborhood. The only other synagogue in this neighborhood was this one, um, which is the synagogue de Tournel, just behind the Place des Vosges. And, um, and I, the, the photograph looks like that quite intentionally because that gives you a very accurate sense of what it was like to, and what it's actually like to look at the facade of the synagogue of its placement in the urban scape. Um, so let me turn now from <coughs> this kind of urban, so the historical context of the synagogue in addition to the massive in-migration of relatively observant, sometimes extremely observant, uh, poor Jews from Eastern Europe from the 1880s onwards, there are two crucial dates for you. The first is 1880, excuse me, 1808, um, when the Napoleonic Concordat established Judaism as one of France's official religions. And that was an extremely important phenomenon because it involved the state support and regulation of a bureaucratic structure known as the consistory. Um, that, and I want to underscore that that's a really a radical move for Judaism because Judaism is normally a hyper-decentralized religion, kind of like Protestantism. Each group of people who choose to worship together worship together where they choose to worship, as they choose to worship, with whoever they choose to lead them. And it's not normally organized under um, bureaucratic structures. It also involves substantial state financial support, so two, two key issues. So there, and furthermore, the consistory as the overarching structure for Judaism in France was required to accept all Jews. And anybody defined as a Jew had to be uh, accepted within the consistory. Um, the second major date for you is 1905, uh, which was the passage of the law separating church and state, which is not, well, not quite right, but that's the shorthand for it, which meant that the state no longer provided robust financial support for religious institutions, and uh, it also did no longer regulate it and the consistory became a private enterprise that could do its own thing. So these both matter a lot for synagogue construction. Uh, until 1874, there was only one purpose-built synagogue in Paris, and it had long been grossly inadequate for the population's needs, a situation to which the consistory attempted to respond. But under the Concordat, when the consistory determined that a new synagogue was needed, it had to appeal to the Ministère des Cultes, that is the Ministry of Religion, uh, and in Paris to the city government for the right to build a synagogue. Um, and they had to negotiate the question of size, location, appearance, and everything else about the synagogue and request a financial subvention for it. Those petitions were usually highly contentious and often ultimately refused. For example, the petition to construct a second synagogue took over a decade of, de of debate and discussion. This was to add to one built in before. And when authorization was finally won in the late 1860s, it was only a, a partial victory. The consistory had proposed a location that would have given the synagogue a prominence and visibility. It would have been a monument kind of presence in the, in the, in the cityscape of the Ninth Arrondissement. Uh, but the prefect of Paris, who was at that time the, the Baron Hausmann, refused, relegating it instead to the narrow side street of the Rue de la Victoire, and added insult to injury by insisting that the consistory would cover half the costs, which was not supposed to be part of the deal. Inaugurated in 1874, and that's, oh, sorry, that's this, you know, this one that you're seeing on the right. Um, it was designed by the architect Alfred Philibert Adroff. The, the, this new synagogue was monumental in scale, dignified in appearance, 
try to try to not see this. <laughs> I should have I should have cut it off or found you a historic image. Um, and uh, it had a very luxurious interior, which I'll show you in a bit, and it accommodated 2,300 people. Um, so it's a, it's a major structure. But its impact on the cityscape was minimized as much as possible. There's no standpoint from which to appreciate the elegant neo-Romano-Byzantine -Rom kind of hybrid facade that it has. The street is narrow, and the building flush with the sidewalk. Uh, with the consequence, the pedestrians uh, could only see the details at eye level. That's the tablets of the wall, which are sitting way up here. Um, can't be seen without a really painful pricking of the neck. I can attest to that. Um, and there's nothing on um, what, what you can see on the bottom here to indicate that this is a synagogue. Um, and there's also a um, Hebrew inscription up there, but again, uh, the pigeons got to view of that. Um, so the same attributes characterize the two other very large consistorial synagogues uh, within the city, the synagogue on Kodit Tulmed, which I showed you the other image of before, and you see here again, um, and that, oh, that opened two years after uh, the one on the Rue de la Victoire in 1876. There's another one inaugurated the year after. Uh, the Rue de la Tournez synagogue was, was built by Marcel Emmanuel Varcolier. Uh, and it was even more awkward replaced than the one on the Rue de la Victoire, um, built into a small side street behind the Place des Vosges uh, in the Marais. And one had to pass really quite directly in front of it to notice it was even there. So these two of these synagogues, the consistorial synagogues, are um, extremely ornate and quite traditionally Jewish within a certain definition of what that means on the inside. And, um, and, as, and while grandiose, um, both French and not French on the outside, they're marked with a, not, with a, with a specific kind of aesthetic, this, you know, this vaguely Eastern notion to mark them as a site of religion of a group that is French but not quite. Um, and uh, they mirror, I would argue, the community's relation to the nation and to the state. The consistory wasn't very happy about having these synagogues <coughs> relegated to side streets um, and with the limits placed on their architecture and their design. Uh, but there wasn't, but that was just the price to be paid for full, for full emancipation, which was unusual in Europe, and the state sought financial support of Jewish religious life. So before the waves of Jewish immigrants coming first from Eastern France after the loss of Alsace and the Franco-Prussian War, and then from Eastern Europe in the last decades of the 19th century, Parisian Jews in general accepted the particular form of religious practice and its, architect and its architectural rendition required by French state society as the cost of a certain kind of inclusion. That changed with the new arrivals. Um, and um, those who did not, so these uh, tens of thousands of Jews coming from Eastern Europe were of uh, very different traditions, both in terms of religious practice and many other things, than the Jews who had been living in France for uh, decades, hundreds of years, thousands of, uh, not thousands, hundreds, hundreds of years in some cases. Uh, and they found often these synagogues uncomfortable uh, and not of a religious of a form of practice in which they were comfortable. Their alternative uh, was to, and these are some of the anachronistic images, because these are later, the only alternative, since the consistory had a monopoly on synagogue construction, was to um, uh, was to pray in other contexts, uh, known as oratories, often housed in converted, converted apartments, warehouses, and shop fronts. These had never been physically particularly comfortable places uh, uh, to, to, to pray and to worship uh, and to study, but by the turn of the century, they were also incredibly overcrowded, so that people were kind of busting out the doors of, of these places. These are two on the other two. So this situation changed. So the, the two, to the two opportunities, um, if you were doing in Paris, uh, before 1905, was to pray in one of the history synagogues or in something that looked something like this. That situation changed with a new law mandating separation of church and state in 1905. Uh, and so the state was no longer permitted to provide economic support, and it, and it only regulated um, new ecclesiastical buildings, not just Jewish, but any ecclesiastical buildings, uh, the same way it regulated all other construction, building permits, and so on. Um, and the consistory was redefined as a private association that could decide on its membership instead of having to accept all Jews. 
So tensions, which had been very long standing anyway, and quite serious, between longer established Jews and the newer immigrants were revealed. And, uh, and overt discrimination against the immigrants was, became possible in a new way. The Parisian consistory, for example, voted to only admit Jews who had been in France for at least 10 years and capped the proportion of foreign board members at one quarter of the population consistory. Um, but, so that's a downside, was an exclusion and in some cases um, quite um, uh, kind of form of ostracism. Um, the new law, however, also created new possibilities for Jewish initiatives, including by those immigrants. So after 1905, those praying in spaces like this could, if they were able to find a site, raise the funds, find an architect and get authorization, build their own synagogue in complete autonomy from the consistory. Um, so that's the context of this. Um, so the Jews of the Pletzel responded quickly to these new possibilities. In 1911, six years after the promulgation of the law, the Se law of separation, the president of Abu Das Hakimios, Joseph Landau, purchased a plot of land usable, if not ideal, for the construction of a new synagogue. The lot was located at 10 Rue Pavé, a narrow medieval street, a stone's throw from the St. Paul metro station in the heart of the Pretzel, and a 10 minute walk from the, from the synagogue of the Rue des Tournais. Landau offered to pay the construction costs of ha half the construction costs of the synagogue if the community could raise the other half. The appeal was successful, and they promptly commissioned Hector Guimard to design their 1,200 seat synagogue. So um, in order to have a sense of why that's such an odd move, um, it's important to know a little bit about what Orthodox Jewish practice requires. First of all, um, Orthodox men ideally go to the synagogue once a day. If they can't make it every day, they go twice a week. So it's a very active part of their lives. Uh, secondly, uh, there are a certain number of features. As I said before, Judaism is not a, it's, it's highly decentralized. It's also uh, not uh, visually very precise in what it mandates. But you need certain things if you're going to have some. You need a place for the Torah scrolls, which are read twice a week. And uh, congregations have several of them. They can take any visual form one wants. There's often a curtain. But you need some place to store the Torah scrolls that is secure and where they can be vertically housed and where they can be easily put in and taken out. You need a place from which a Torah is read. There are large scrolls generally take up a lot of room. Uh, the two op oops, excuse me. The two options are generally in the center of the of the of the sanctuary, the center of the of the space. Uh, and there that, that's the place where it's actually read from. The the east the, 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 the Torahs are usually stored on the eastern, stored on the eastern end, if you can, to be oriented towards Jerusalem, so up there, and then read from here, or a kind of more uh, auditorium structure, where everything is oriented towards the front. Those are the two general models. Either are good. In an Orthodox synagogue, excuse the end, there's a typo in the label, um, you also, women and men don't, don't worship together, so there's a need for physical separation. That can be done in any way you want. Uh, generally, it's uh, the balcony structure was the most common. So this is just an example. So you, you definitely need a separation of men and women. You definitely do not need an organ. Um, and you um, also would need an, an eternal light, a light that indicates the, the omnipresence of God. Um, and that can, again, take it. The reason I'm giving you these variety of slides is to indicate the range of possibility. Um, and the other thing you need, this is, you don't really need but it's a common practice, is a list of the members of the congregation um, who have died um, over the and it's kind of place um, to be able to, um, you know, it shows their dates of death and dates of, and, um, dates of birth, dates of death, and when we should be celebrating their, the anniversary of their deaths. Um, so this is a, a 1917 image of the same synagogue of Mehmedia Rosier. You'll notice just in passing, I don't know if anybody saw before, there is no Star of David here, which, is a late, which was a later edition and there did not exist. Um, so there are several things that are striking about the synagogue. Um, but actually, before I get into them, let me just say that the Association of Synagogues would have told Kimar with some precision um, how they wanted the elements I just discussed to be distributed and allocated. And they would have felt quite strongly about that. 
question of whether the bima, the place through the Torah, was in the center of it or at one end mattered, whether they were more side by side or above mattered. So that would all have been non-negotiable. Um, and um, and the, the plot was located in the right in right orientation. So this is the west side and the other end is the east side. So it was not difficult to put the Torah ark where it belonged from an observer, observant standpoint. So certain things were fairly easy. Um, and um, this, so the one set of constraints was he had to figure out a way of getting those elements into this building. He was constrained, obviously, by the plot. It's this very long, narrow plot. Uh, it's a 1,200-seat synagogue. So, that, so there's the, the question of verticality as a strategy is, is an issue. Um, and money. That, that, that was obviously a finite amount of money. So um, he made a series of choices in the facade. One was, again, the Rue Pavé is another, is a really narrow street. But um, in contrast to the consistorial synagogues, he did his best to get some offset from the, from the, from the, from the, from the, paper, from the sidewall and to get as much perspective onto the front of the synagogue as he could get without having it set too far back, which would have cost him too much space in the depth of the sanctuary and the seating. So, and then it's the, this, the building is concrete but faced in stone that, again, you can't tell in black and white. That, kind of marries with the, with the buildings around it. Um, and it is a distinctively, we'll see some more elements, see this more closely later. It, it has the elements, it has clearly, uh, it's clearly in the Gimach style um, without, uh, you know, without, I mean, you see the elements here and in the shapes of the windows. And, in, and up here, there are the two tablets of the law, again, in their conventional place for a French synagogue. So there's nothing, so, there's nothing kind of outrageous about it, but it has, but it's de it's a definite distance from the Ro the, the Romano Byzantine style that we've just been seeing, also in its narrowness. Although again, that was not entirely a matter of choice. So, um, so what did he do with it, um, and how did this work? So this one you're looking east, uh, and this is the, um, the 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 place to store the Torah scrolls is behind this this. Curtain is quite common to have a curtain, although this is a particularly uh, large and spectacular one. The eternal light is right up there. The, the, the memorial plaques are there. Um, and there's a lectern from which to um, uh, talk to the congregation from here, and another place to, uh, to read from here. Uh, you'll see another. There are other slides on which you see the images. The, the lighting fixtures that you see here are uh, could have been in many other email locations. There's nothing particularly distinctive about them. The, uh, the, the, this structure, which is not the ark, it's in front of it, is uh, not particularly in his style at all, nor is this structure here. The lighting fixtures and the benches stick within his um, And here's the same. Um, you're, you know, same view basically, but just giving it to you in color, and also, so to give you a sense of the glass work up here that let light into this extremely narrow space. Uh, there's there's glass above. You'll see in a minute. You get a glimpse of the galleries up here. Also, the library that was part of it, since people study as well as pray in the synagogue. And here you're you're really at the edge of the the bima, the place from which the Torah was read, which was centrally mm -hmm. located. And again, a very good view of uh, a lamp fixture, of the light fixtures, um, as well as of the decor. Mm -hmm. um, and here you get the women's galleries. Clearly, the, in this in this synagogue, because of the height, it's actually here that the women's galleries originally were, the second balcony, because uh, uh, there wasn't enough space on the ground floor for the men, uh, and women were less added participants, perhaps because of where they were located, but that's another topic. Um, and, um, and so then here you see the Bima again, to get, just give you a sense of the dimensions. Um, and these are two views of the, of the pews, which I wanted to give you, um, with, where they're, the, and what's particularly striking is the motion and the undulation that they get when you see them all aligned like that mm -hmm. and, and all mass. Um, and I want to, if, if thinking about it, I'll have a slide later about this in the benches that you saw earlier um, in another presentation. So with the benches, we, we find again, and also the nature of the, uh, of the woodworking facade there, of a characteristic human book. Um, 
Um, and here I wanted this slide mostly to, to show you the, the decoration of the ceilings as well as the, the, the detail of the ironwork marking the back. And this is back just to give you the memorial plaques there. This is a later edition, and it's not a video, it doesn't in some sense fit with the rest of the So in sum, this building is both definitively um, a Guimard building, both inside and out, and is both reminiscent of and distant from the consistories and the guts of the 1870s. Although the cement facade is faced with stone that matches the adjacent 17th and 18th century buildings, the choice of stone is pretty much the only concession to visual integration into the street's architecture, from the organically curved roof line and undulating facade, which creates a horizontal movement that balances the verticality generated by the height of the building in relation to its narrow width, the structure stands out. It is furthermore set as far back as possible from the street without sacrificing the interior depth so as to allow passersby a view of its entirety. As we've just seen from the interior, while fully adapted to the religious practice of the Jews who prayed and studied there, it's equally and systematically up and down. From the light fixtures to the benches to the plaster and iron work, it's all instantly recognizable, not just as a Huvo, but as a work of Guimard. Um, so why? You know, why do this? Um, particularly, again, the group of uh, congregations who commissioned this were uh, Eastern European migrants. They were deeply orthodox in their practice. They often had marginal French. They were um, not well integrated. They were by, but they had been by now in the country for 30-ish years, most of them. They had had children, um, which is an important feature. Many of them no longer lived in the neighborhood, actually, uh, or right immediately in the neighborhood. They made enough money to move a little bit away, so, although still within enough walking distance to um, so, you know, the classic explanation, most obvious one for why Guimard is that, um, and it's, you know, I'm sure has truth to it, is that um, Guimard was chosen because he was the husband of the president of the association's niece, Adeline Oppenheim, who about whom we heard this morning. Um, it's pretty clear, however, that that's not the whole story. Um, and I'd like to um, just note here that I'm very indebted to the work of the preeminent scholar of French uh, synagogues, um, architecture, Dominique Jarrassé, who's done some really good work on the synagogue and all the others. Um, we don't interpret this building exactly the same way, but his work is amazing. So um, even though this synagogue, this commission came after Guimard had a more solid corpus of work behind him, hiring him was a really bold move. And I don't think that the niece was a good enough justification or making that move. Guimard was not Jewish, uh, and his only previous project, and his wife was no longer Jewish either, uh, the conversion to Kalai. She was by Jewish law, you can't cease to be a Jew by Jewish law, but she chosen to leave the community. Um, and his only previous projects uh, destined for religious purpose were the 1894 reconstruction of the old church of Auteuil, uh, a number of tombs and funerary chapels, and a building for the Ecole du Sacré-Cœur. None of them was really an appropriate preparation for this commission. So kind of wild architecture, not really the right experience. He also had um, either, he had very few auditoriums to, under his belt at this point. Uh, there was the small Théâtre de la Berlinière, uh, but he wasn't really a theater builder. Uh, he had done some commercial work, but the vast majority of his designs beyond the subway stations were for dwellings. Uh, so he not uh, so he not only he lacked experience in this kind of construction, and Art Nouveau would, ne would definitively mark this, this this synagogue off from all other ecclesiastical buildings in Paris. There was nothing comparable among churches either at this point. Um, they were really then synagogues were all marked in the Romanesque Byzantine occasionally Moorish style, which you've seen examples, which was again not accidental. It was clear that this was a way of marking Jews' position not just inside outside, as I said before, but between East and West, which was a common way of conceptualizing where Jews belonged in this period or where they were located. Um, and um, notably, the synagogue on the Rue des Tournelles in that style was just down the street. And uh, that one and the one on the Rue de la Victoire that I showed you earlier would have been familiar to all Christian Jews. So they had an idea of what a synagogue looks like and it was not this. Um, and it would also have been fully known to them, and, and, and Yimau would have made it known to them if they didn't know it already, that he designed holistically the Gazam Kunstwerk that we've talked about before, 
far from limiting his labors to external structure, every element of his buildings inside and out was going to be marked by his version of modern, modernist naturalism. Um, and there wasn't no, was no going to be give and take on that. That was what it was going to be. So the leaders of Abu Das Hakebido's uh, association had to be fully committed to Gimal's vision. And the choice, and, and there were you know, very well equipped Jewish architects at this point who were, built, who were experienced in synagogue construction, <coughs> inclu including Pontremodi, Bechman, Hess. Uh, and there were other architects, non Jewish architects, who also built synagogues. Um, and they didn't choose them, and they didn't choose them even after the first version of the synagogue was refused by the city of Paris, and they had to go back to the drawing board and, and reconfigure it again. So they stuck with it. Um, and the synagogue was inaugurated in 1914. So I think that the reason, the, uh, what, uh, a crucial reason, for why uh, the, this group of, of Jews chose this, chose Gima from this style, was that they were following in the footsteps of Adrien Benard and the Parisian Municipal Council a decade earlier when they found in Guimard's designs the ideal merging of modernity and Frenchness to build the Parisian Met Hall, which was also a very highly contested uh, um, design problem. Um, and, I, and I want to emphasize both modernity and Frenchness. And Sarah this morning mentioned that you know, Guimard's vision that he was doing something that was Guimard, but it was also a very distinctly French version of Art Nouveau. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the Nouveau part of it as well. And um, they had um, come to that understanding um, not only, and I think maybe not primarily, although one needs more research on this, as the Parisian Municipal Council had done for the Metro through circulation in Art Nouveau's art circles, because most of these people were not circulating in, in, in avant-garde art circles, but through their daily contact with Guimard stations, Metro stations, notably the one in the middle of the Plaza at San Paul. Um, and so I, I'm sorry, this was just to give you the sense of the repetition. And this is not the San Paul Metro, but it was to give you this, the, you know, the, other, the other common comparison. So um, the San Paul Metro, which was, um, uh, was one of the um, early stations in the Paris system, as I mentioned before, and, um, and its opening was an, a sign of modernity and Frenchness in a neighborhood often characterized in very different terms. And here I quote, uh, this is from a 1915 text. The Jews who inhabit the ghetto, the Talmudist Jews, the Polacks, as the other Parisian Jews call them, are poverty-stricken people who misery or persecution caused to flee the countries where they were born. They are also religious fanatics. Seeing them one feels like one is no longer in Paris, but far, far away. That far away country is here, a few hundred meters from the Tête de Ville in the middle of Paris. So Charles Fidel's 1915 description is particularly vivid but not atypical of anti-Semitic tropes of the time. While it's certainly the case that overcrowding and minimal plumbing characterize living conditions in the Marais, as those slides I showed you at the beginning of the talk indicate, the same was true of the vast majority of French urban dwellers, at least into the 1930s, if not into the post-war period. Isabelle Bakouche and other scholars have shown that the characterization of the Marais as exceptionally insalubrious, particularly decrepit, and in need of urgent need of demolition and reconstruction was intimately tied to its characterization as a Jewish neighborhood. Those commissioning Guimard's modernist synagogues would have been well aware of this perception of the neighborhood and its inhabitants as archaic and not French. They were also well aware that their perception was shared by a lot of their fellow Parisian Jews. The consistory and the Franco-French Jews of Paris had been hostile to the synagogue's founding, hoping that the immigrant Jews would assimilate into the norms of Parisian Jewish religious and secular life. Their hostility extended to refusal to attend its inauguration. Their new, the, their new place of worship, uh, the, the Eastern European Jews' new place of worship, allowed them to contest that image, a visual argument that Paris's poor, religious poor Jews were as French and as modern as the city's subway system. As we have seen, one should underscore that the congregation's choice to pray and to study in a modern French space was for themselves as well as for the outside world. The, they, the interior of the synagogue is fully up and roll in its style, the benches, the wooden screens providing modesty in the women's gallery, the ironwork, the lighting fixtures, the painted ceiling motifs, 
The stuff in detail, the windows, the internal stone motifs were all Guimard, and all echo the sinuous etiquette to be found around the corner on the Pretzel, as well as ubiquitous throughout the city. The message is clear. There is no contradiction between being an observant Jew, French, and modern. The choice had deep resonance. Four of the other five Paris area synagogues built, or in one case expand in this period, are also in the modern style. So you see on the, on the right, I guess you're right, yeah. This is the uh, Synagogue de l'Arche saint uh, and these are both later, of course, in date. Um, and which is a very, which is in Belleville, poor, it was a very poor congregation, the one on the bottom left is a 37 addition to the synagogue in the, in the in Nuyi, which is one of the wealthiest congregations in Paris. So at both ends in this period, they move towards a very different modernity than the modernity of Gima, but nonetheless uh, move in that yeah. direction. Uh, the leaders in the Jewish communities in the early decades of the 20th century, I argue, were influenced in their conception of what it meant to be French and how to achieve legitimacy for a group of French Jews viewed with particular suspicion by their daily encounters with Ektiochi, Mars, and in the middle of the main artery of the Plaza of the rest of the Persian subway network. Through the architecture they chose for their synagogue, they both shaped perceptions of French Jewry and sought to recast Parisian Jews' conception of themselves. That recasting was distinctively French and modern with attachments to neighborhood country of origin, or Palestine, or the past, downplayed. So I want to just conclude with an image from my two images of the synagogue, both of which are kind of spectacular. Um, this is Frank Lloyd Wright's 1959 Best Shalom Synagogue in Elkins Park, outside of Philadelphia. And here we have another you know, ar artist, architect, uh, who in this case works in close collaboration with the, with the rabbi of the synagogue to produce a vision of American Judaism in the post-war period that would be distinctive, that would be modern, that would, um, in this case, there's a theological kind of implication built into this building, which is not the case in the Gimal synagogue. And I think that's really important. That is, in the French case, you get a perfect version of a, you know, if you could translate a metro station into a synagogue, you get the synagogue de la République. In this case, Wright constructed something that was a distinctly American thing, but highly individualistic, designed also with a strong theological um, story to it. It's, it's, it's coming up to it's coming up to Mount Sinai is what this is what this is about, and that would have been not possible in the French context, where it could go a certain distance to um, individuate in this, this congregation, um, but it, like the Paris Metro station, it is um, it's, it, it's fitting into a certain vision uniform vision of Frenchness. So I will stop there and I'll happily answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Uh, this was fascinating. Uh, I made a mistake earlier. Uh, we will break at 2.30, so we have time for the question uh, about uh, Leora's presentation. So uh, don't hesitate, monsieur. I'll give you the, I'll come to you after, okay? Why was uh, why did the city reject Kumar's first uh, design? Um, that it was um, it was even taller than this one, it, and and was the at least again the argument given was that it would that the primary argument there were there were detailed complaints as well, but that the, that the dominant one was that it was it was it, it, its its roof line was was too high. Whether that was a uh, you know, the, the, whether that was a fundamental issue or not is unclear. The earlier synagogues you showed with the arched mm -hmm. center opening, that seemed to be a pattern throughout Europe mm -hmm. for synagogues in the 70s. Uh, was it the 1905 separation that meant that they went totally opposite with uh, the height and the the enfolding of the top of the Guimard design, rather than following the traditional yeah. central arch. Yeah, I think I mean you're right, you're absolutely right that there's I mean the the those, the, the 70s synagogues you know the synagogues that were built in Europe from the 50s through the 70s into the 80s where later in some context 
were what you know what people call cathedral synagogues. That is, that there are these massive structures often, and in places other than France, you know, the other place I work on a lot is Berlin, they're often freestanding and very and highly visible, a different set of constraints, but nonetheless very, um, very, uh, very um, large and, and, um, and marked by this the, the Byzantine or Moorish kind of aesthetic. And so I think what the what the change what the radical change is with the move away from uh, an, an, uh, the look east, so to speak, and an insistence on trying to find an aesthetic that's either international, which happened, which is which is a move made by by say Mendelssohn in the in the German context, or to this kind of the, in the in the French this version, and in this period to to Guimard, and then later uh, to um, uh, you know Art Deco versions, and I had one an image of Sarcelles in the 1970s. That's that's. Uh, another version of modernism. So I think the 1905 um, separation gives them a kind, they give, it gives them a freedom because they didn't need the state authorization anymore in the French context. But it's but there's something to move away from that style of architecture elsewhere in Europe where there wasn't the same kind of constraint. How much would the chief rabbi of, of Paris had, did he have any decision making no. thing? No. No, about no, the no. architecture. No, that's what's interesting is that this that because it's all it's uh, after after 1905 it's entirely a given congregation that has the or, or an association of congregations in this in this case that has the, the right to make it, to decide what it's going to what it's going to do as long as the city will approve it. Oh, I'll move to that. Wait for the mic. Sorry to mention that, and I just I missed it. Were there any other continental European congregations outside Paris that also decided to go with Art, Art Nouveau uh, for their synagogue construction, or that you know of? There are in uh, in Central Europe. In, there are yeah, there are versions in Central Europe. There's nothing that's quite as um, it, you know as systematically, but that's because that's how Guimard built. But yes, so it, it, that um, and then and then there are. Uh, in, in Prague and um, also um, in Germany, Hungary, there are yeah, there are other examples, but um, from the period in the various local styles of organization, secession. Um, if I may ask you a question, I'm curious. Uh, the building is so particular, uh, so different. Uh, do you think it would feel different to pray in such a building than in the other type of synagogue? Yeah, I mean that's I think um, I think part of why they wanted to build it, and I think part of the effect of it is that um, it's uh, that the continuity between it and say the metro stations of a, kind of a different relationship to um, to space, uh, to light but also to that the organic world that's carried out in Gimau's, um, in Gimau's style and his design elements. I think uh, the effect, I, mean, I, I had a slide which I skipped, of the, that showed the interior of the consistory synagogues, which um, are dark and you know, velvet ensconced and look like an overstuffed living room um, in some ways. And this would be both um, a much lighter experience and, and brighter, um, and um, and also um, uh, modern in a sense, as well as tied to the natural world. And given the frequency with which Orthodox people are in synagogue, it's, which I, I'm repeating, but it matters in terms of the sensory experience, embodied experience of being in a synagogue. Um, I think it does make it so that they're they're imbibing a sense of French modernity through their participation in, in religious practice here and melding again it's a long it's a long ritual um, and a very traditional one in a context that's anything but traditional. So, but you know, I think you know what I'm saying, and I think that space matters and how people <laughs> live their lives and what they. Well, it's very intimate with the narrowness of the yes. space and the, the soaring. Obviously, yes. in his perfect view, it would have soared even yes. higher. So, uh, yeah, I no, know, very different uh, space and habitat. Wait, madame. Do you think, do you have any uh, evidence that the congregation became less conservative? Um, after an, uh, during a course of another generation uh, with this, you know, the impact of the space? Yeah, that's an interesting question. 
Um, you know, they, it is the next generation. Right. So if that who becomes the, the, the most frequent uh, participants. I don't really know. I and mean, one thing I was thinking about, I, I, there's a photograph that I've seen of the synagogue during the Second World War. And at that point, the, the, and it shows the, the balconies where there's a mixed population. Well, who shouldn't have been there? But, uh, but it was also the middle of the war. So, uh, you know, that doesn't really, that doesn't really say anything. It, it, if it did become, and this is something I'd like to do more work to find out, if it did become less orthodox, it, it came back again. That is, it is now, yeah, now, and it, and, it, and, it, and it is, even by the 60s, it has, it, it was, uh, it was really uh, traditional orthodox again, although uh, much of a, a North African rather than uh, uh, I just had two thoughts. One, the setback is so interesting, but I think the setback is actually that the, the street has been legislated to be wider, and so he's required to set back like that. But that's my question to you, because you find that all over Paris. So, yeah, so, so you know, which is why you have this ugly revelation of the party walls on either side of it. But, you know, and then this goes out of effect, so at some point they're allowed to put a fence up and, right. take, and, and take over that courtyard, but I don't think at the okay. beginning that courtyard is not there. It's, it's, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just an extension. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the other question I had was, so I, I wrote my dissertation on an architect who did a Romano-Byzantine cathedral, Catholic. So, I actually find that those, those 1870s buildings are much more assimilationist than, than they are exotic in the way that, say, Otto Wagner's first synagogue in, in Budapest is very exotic. Uh, they seem to be rather anti-exotic because there's also, particularly in Protestant churches, an enormous use of Romano-Byzantine style, and perhaps not quite the same. So I think it's not quite as, for me, it's not quite as pronounced a visual decoration. Yeah, I would say to, I mean, I think that it's, um, I have two things. One is that, you know, when one reads, um, you know, arch uh, architectural treatises on appropriate architecture at this period for a synagogue, this is, this and that is what you're supposed to do in a way that isn't the case when you read treatises on what you're supposed to build if you're building a Protestant or a Catholic church. There, the range of available dis rhetorical discourse is broader. And so, so our, yeah, <laughs> right. So architects were being trained that this is what, and when they were doing the, you know, the contests, or the, you know, the, or the, um, the final products for um, for your project, where you're going to be you know, leaving architecture school, um, where you know that in those, I, there, yeah, there are no examples of Gothic, Gothic synagogues. Um, I think. In the, or Romanesque, for that. I mean, are there all the, the in terms of the visual repertoire available? That's it. Um, and then it also is. Um, I would say when you compare the, the the nature of the curves and the the, the proportions and stuff of, of the synagogues built in this style to the the churches that that they, the pole east is greater than in the in the in the, in the, in the churches, but that that is a matter of that's a matter of interpretation. It is certainly assimilationist also. I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's East, but you're still conforming at some level, which is what was being demanded of Jews. I mean, the, the hope was for Jews to disappear, really. Um, and this was a way of, you know, of, of, this, of, of allowing enough practice, but within, within constraint. Um, and also, they're not allowed to be freestanding. I mean, to not have yeah, the perspective, yeah. uh, unlike a new church. I don't know how to formulate this as a question, but uh, when you, this gentleman asked about the setback, uh, it, it, the, the undulation of the facade made me think of the small Cardinal Borromini churches in Rome. And when you look at the choices about the undulations, when they're in narrow spaces uh, like the Glimmer, church, they tend to be kind of cavities with only the uh, entrance then projecting forward. And it had, I wonder if you looked at that or you know anything about it in relation to 
Guimara's work because with the Borromini things, it, it's always seemed like there was a, like the gesture was a perspectival one that attempted to create urban space as a as an entry space to the church, or in this case to the synagogue, where the actual condition of the street urbanistically did not allow the creation of an actual forecourt. Yeah, that's very interesting. I hadn't thought of that, and I will look into it. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I read that the, the synagogue was damaged with a gas explosion and then again during the war was several times attacked, luckily not successfully. But I was just wondering about, was, has it been a continuous place of worship even during the war years? And also when the restoration happened, how much of the original design was lost? Um, as, far as, I, as far as I know, there has been uh, continuous within, you know, within the limits of the possible, it's been in use continuously. Um, and uh, and the rest and and it's been repaired each time, restored each time as close as possible, you know, to the to the original. It might not meet conservation standards by you know uh, the way you know conservation standards keep changing, or, but it, but it, an effort has been made. There's been a strong sense. The congregation has a strong sense of the value of the of the building, and and right now, I mean, um, Nikola knows more about this than I do. But there's a there's a restoration there's a there's a restoration F, you know project now to return it. More to its original state because there were things changed, like the Star of David. I mean, things have changed, and there, but there's a now, and actually, you know, it's an ongoing effort right now. But at the time, there was they were trying to keep it to respect it. Okay, the main. During the Nazi occupation, what did happen to Jewish temples in Paris? Were they just retained? I mean, they couldn't be wor worshipped in. They were rounding up Jews. They were. Um, it depends on which. It, it depends on which period, but uh, they were. Um, they they were not destroyed. Unlike, I mean, Paris was was uh, was intact. Um, intact. Right, relatively. Um, and um, yes, they were not in periods of roundups. They were not. They were not being used for, for, for services. But they were. They were. The buildings were there. They were left. Uh, in some cases, there was there was desecration that had to be then undone, but not but not actual violent destruction. Um, you know, Laura, it's almost it is two thirty. So uh, how about we take a little break first? We want to say thank you to Laura for this very inspiring talk. <laughs> Don't forget in 15 minutes, okay?